All right. Well, welcome to Discovery. It's me again, Pastor Sean. I am so glad that you guys are joining us today. How many of you guys decided to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. I don't want to forget, for those of you guys who are joining us online, we're so grateful that you guys are here with us, and you are also in the house of the Lord, no matter where you are, because God is where we are, amen? Um, so we are excited about this message that we're diving into. I'm super excited about it. We've been going on with this message of relationship rehab. How many of you guys been enjoying the messages so far, right? We had the first one, which was the uh, friendship, right? I mean, here's the thing about relationships. Every single relationship is going to need rehab, right? Like, we're... One way or another, humans are humans, they're going to make mistakes, you're going to make a mistake, and afterwards you're going to need some rehabilitation, right? You're going to need some way to fix that relationship. So we've had an awesome opportunity to start week one. We talked about friendships and setting the proper boundaries, and then week two last week was so special, so cool, seeing Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica up here leading us through how to restore harmony in our marriage. That was so amazing. Um, and just to even speak to that man, it's such an honor and privilege to do life with them. Their marriage is such an awesome reflection of what God intended it to be. And so to be able to see it um, and to see it reflected uh, last week was such a beautiful opportunity. Um, and, and the crazy thing about this idea of like relationship rehab, <clears throat> I want to make sure we stop and, and take a moment because I, in conversations sometimes I'll, I'll talk to individuals and sometimes they feel like relationships aren't crucial to their walk with the Lord. Right, like, why don't you dive into the heavy stuff is sometimes what we get, right? Why don't you dive into the heavy stuff? Can I tell you something? Relationships with one another is one of the few things that God points out to say, if you don't have your relationship right with others, you and I will not have the right relationship. He literally says at one point, he's saying that if you come to me in prayer and you're seeking me, he says, if you are holding unforgiveness and bitterness for somebody else, I actually won't hear you, and it's better for you to just go and make that right before you come back to me. So rehab is pretty crucial in our journey of relationships and our journey with the Father. If we don't have things right with one another, it can literally reflect and hurt our relationship with the Father. We see it in 2 Corinthians. Paul's writing this letter, and he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. And he says this, strive for full restoration. He says, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace. And it says, and the God of love and peace will be with you. It's kind of reflecting that idea is as you live that out, the God of peace and love will will be with you. And so that's why it's so crucial that we operate under this lifestyle, that we're constantly striving to make peace with one another and get things right with one another. And that kind of leads us into this third topic, which um, everyone loves talking about and everyone loves getting instruction on and that is parenting right we're talking about parenting and parenting to restoration and uh it's it's funny because i know it's like one of the rules that everybody loves to talk about please tell me how to raise my kids right please discipline my children nobody wants that right so i want to kind of preface it if you're already like kind of sitting there like dude this is going to tell me how to raise my kids like that's not what we're doing here i I, i'm not going to give you tactics. I'm not going to set everything up for you. Here's the thing. As we end today, you're not going to like have perfect kids because of what I've explained to you, right? Like it's not like you leave today and your kids are not going to throw tantrums ever again, right? Because I figured it out and I'm going to share it with you. You're not going to have teenagers that aren't going to be rebellious and be snotty to you because Pastor Sean gave you the exact tactics to fix your children. That's not what we're talking about, okay? We're instead just talking about this concept of how we should be leading our children, Okay, so we're all going to make mistakes in parenting. We're all going to be under the same mindset there. It's going to happen. But I think something that we have to talk about that maybe we're missing out on is this concept that we're going to start here. And and that is that parenting should lead to the big picture. So where sometimes we get caught up in our day-to-day lives and we get caught up in moment-to-moment with our kids, and if you're living that kind of way, you're going to find that a lot of times you're going to have emotional reactions to what it is that's transpiring in your life. When your kids act how kids always act, you're going to react emotionally if you're missing out on this concept of a big picture parenting style. And and the whole big picture of what we're trying to do as parents, if I could help you understand this, you have like one main job. Because if we believe this concept that God is the one who blesses us with our children, and that's step one. So step two, that means that God has given you and entrusted you with a very valuable and prized, you know, a, a very important mission in the lives of that child. 
And so if we're missing this concept of what's the main mission of our job, I, I need us to understand that this is Parenting Goal 101. This is what we want from our kids. And that is we want them to be adult followers of Christ. That's your job. That's your job. Graduating college, cool, but that's not your number one job. Our number one job is to raise up adult followers of Christ. So I want us to take a look at like how we've been doing with that so far. There's actually some stats to this idea of how things have been going in raising up adult followers of Christ because this generation is, is having a hard time with this. So here's the thing. Starting off, I want to share some stats with you about how it's going so far, right? So interestingly enough, the generation of those who are 60 and older, okay, so those individuals who are 60 years and up, of those 60 years and older that identified that they believe in the God of the Bible, it's about 70% of that generation, 60 and up, 70% say, yes, I believe in the God that's taught in the Bible, that's my God, right? So, okay, that's our, that's our leading generation that's passing on this legacy to our younger generation. So let's see how that legacy, how that baton is being passed so far. So in 18 to 29-year-olds, it says 20% Believe in a God, but not the God in the Bible. Okay? 24% believe in a higher power, but not a God. So they believe in their horoscopes. They believe in the sun and the moon and the stars, right? But there's no, there's no God. It's just this higher being that's, right? Uh, you know, they're getting out there with some of those spiritual presence and stuff. About 31% is where we're at that believe in the God of the Bible. One in four actually don't believe in any God whatsoever. No higher power, nothing. So that means at this point, statistically speaking, if you were to walk up to an 18 or 29-year-old for one of the first times ever, our generation, the likelihood is if you're meeting somebody 18 to 29 years old, they do not believe in the God of the Bible. In fact, one in five, 20% at this point actually will attend church. One in five individuals will attend church from the age of 18 to 29. And of all these, one in four re report having prayed daily. And that's not even to the God in the Bible. That just means one in four of them say, I do pray daily. Like, I want that to sink in, and I, and I want us to kind of come to terms with this idea of how is this baton being passed? How are we raising up this next generation? Because 70%, 7 out of 10 that are 60 and up, they are following Christ. They're believers in the God of the Bible. But yet, for some reason, that translates to three out of ten. Less than half of the batons were passed properly. And I think it has to do with this concept that we're not raising children with the big picture in mind. We're not raising children with the number one goal of leading to become adult followers in Christ. And that's because sometimes we end up leading moment to moment. And so I want us to talk us through this. Uh, we're going to walk through this journey of, of parenting and what it looks like. The first one we're going to look at is some of the ways that most of us probably operate in and are currently parenting, like our, our, our parent tactics right now. All of us are going to be operating these. Trust me, as I go through the list, we're all going to have them. But then we're going to talk about how we should be doing this, and then we're going to talk about where we're leading our children to. So we're going to start off with this concept of behavioral band-aids, okay? Behavioral band-aids. What does that mean? It's like rather than actually dealing with the wound, this is just something you put on top of it. Right? This is just how you cover up the current situation, right? So we're going to start off with an example. I hope you guys are going to understand this. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this game. It's called Paper, Rock, Scissors. Everybody here familiar with the game Paper, Rock, Scissors? Yes? Okay. So help me out here. Uh, rock beats what? Wow. We'll get there, y'all. It's great. We're waking up all together, right? So rock beats scissors, right? Rock hammers the scissors. Scissors beats what? Scissor cuts the paper. I'm, it makes sense to me. Rock is crushing the scissors. Scissors is cutting the paper. Now tell me, what does paper beat? No. Like, that is one of the most, absolutely not, in any world whatsoever would we say paper beats rock, right? I hate so much. Like, okay, do me a favor. I'll give you paper, and I'll get rock. You and I, who's going to win that matchup, right? Like, no one is thinking paper, and, and the whole concept is this. Paper covers rock. So? Rock is fine. Rock is just covered by your paper. I, like, rock is intact. Right? You haven't broken the rock yet. If anything, you gave me more mass to now throw rock. Right? 
Nothing has changed with the rock. All you've done is giving it a covering. This is what behavioral band-aids do, right? This is how a lot of us are currently parenting, where the heart of the situation with your child is not changed. The hardened heart is still the hardened heart. All you've done is covered it with something, temporary. The problem is, once you're removed from the picture and they're adults now, the paper's only removed, the rock is the rock. It's still the same as it was before because you didn't deal with the heart of the situation, okay? So what are some of those things that we tend to walk into, these temporary band-aids, these things that um, we'll implement oftentimes because they kind of cure the situation? The number one tactic, the first one that we use a lot, is fear, right? How do we get our kids to listen quickly? We put the fear of God in them, right? Like we let them know, right? Like how does that sound like? Like you don't want me to go in there. And what do the kids do? If they're scared, they're like, oh, I don't. You're right. I don't want you to come in here, right? So they, they hide and they're scared. It's like, you do that again. You don't want to see what's going to happen. You're right. I don't want to see what happens, right? But are they actually realizing what they're doing is wrong or are they only scared of you so they don't want to do it again? Rock is still intact. They're not looking at the situation and realizing actually what I was doing was wrong. They're looking at the situation and saying, I don't want them to do whatever it is they're threatening me to do, right? So a prime example, anybody have like hung out with more than one kid, so you got two kids and one of them has a toy? What's the inevitable? Boys, uh, you know, they're going to take that toy because that toy looks fine. Now it's my toy. And then the other kid starts crying, and now you have to step into the situation. And if you lead with fear, what do you say? Give it back or you're going to get whatever. It's a threat, right? Give it back or X is going to happen, right? And so the kid gives it back. And so they're only learning. They're only reacting because they've been threatened, and they don't want to see what's going to happen. But here's the thing. What happens when you leave the room? I'm going to snag it back. And the good brothers who knew what they were doing, then they shut up the younger child so that they didn't yell so it never got found out. You didn't fix the situation. You just covered it with the paper. Kid is still intact. They're still crazy, right? They're still doing the same thing they were doing before. All you did was cover it up. And Proverbs spells it out so well. He says, fearing people, that's a dangerous trap. He says, trust in the Lord. That means safety. Right? When you instill fear in your kids, you're creating a trap because here's what's going to happen to most of us. At some point, those kids grow up. And at some point, your threats mean a little bit less every year. right? Because you're going to keep threatening with the spanking. You're going to keep threatening with whatever it is that's your arsenal, whatever it is you attack them with. And what happens as they get older, your arsenal, your weapons need to increase too. So you started off threatening with little simple spankings, and those were working well. Then you threatened, and the threats moved up and moved up. And now when they're older, you're threatening like, okay, well, then you get out of the house. So now I've gone with threats of one thing to threats of your own security, right? And now I'm not leading them to anything. I'm merely trying to cover it with another paper and cover it with another paper. And now I've created the stacking effect where my fear tactic is no longer working, okay? So that's the number one tactic we use oftentimes. Number two is uh, my least favorite, and that is shame, or you kind of tag that with guilt, right? Is anybody familiar with the tactic of a good guilt trip? Oh, it's the worst, isn't it? I always, every time I say it, I always hear the one like, oh, I don't want to, ooh, don't even talk to me about guilt trips, right? Guilt trips are the worst, dude, because it's like you're doing, they convince you to do something. It didn't at all change your heart. You're doing it because you're like, yeah, I don't want her to be sad, so I guess I'll do it, right? Like, prime example, I ain't trying to call nobody out, but it's like, it's like the idea like, don't you love me? If you loved me, you would do this. If you loved me, you'd do the dishes for me. It's like kids like, man, fine. You know, like, I don't want you to feel bad. Because now, if they say no, now it's like questioning their love, right? It's like you put them in a situation, their heart is still like, I don't want to do nothing for you. I'm just doing it because I don't want you to feel bad, or I'm just doing it because I don't want to say. But the heart is still the same. You've just guilted them into something. So here's what happens if you use guilt and shame all the time. We actually see it spelled out so well in the story of Adam and Eve. Okay, If you're not familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, simple breakdown. God makes Adam and Eve, loves to hang out with them. And then he's like, hey, do me a favor, don't eat that. And then he goes, and they're like, hey, you want to try it, right? Of course, there's a snake involved with it. But then Eve, the worst, she bites, I'm just kidding. They were both there, right? 
So Eve takes it, right? And she eats the apple, and Adam's like, let me try it now, because he's there the whole time. Could have stopped it at any moment. He's like, let me try it. Nothing happened to you. He eats the apple. And then in Genesis, it says, at that moment, their eyes are opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So like Eve eats the apple, Adam eats the apple, and they're like, whoa, where'd those come from? Right? Whoa, something's changed. Something's different. We're naked, and we need to hide some parts. And then it goes a step further. God, because he loves hanging out with them, is now coming to the time where he's coming down to hang out with them. So Adam and Eve are there, and what do they do? They hide. What does shame and guilt lead to? Hiding. So now when your kids make their mistakes and they do something wrong, if all they get is guilt and shame and guilt and shame as the weapon tactic, when they make mistakes now, they don't come to you. They hide because they don't want to feel that guilt and that shame. And the worst part is is sometimes we use God as our guilt and shame tactic where we say, ooh, you know God's watching you right now? Oh, can you, God saw what you did. We bring him into the equation of guilt and shame. And I can only imagine God's up there like, what are you doing? I didn't say it. Like, I didn't play a part in that. I want him to come to me with that. And you're trying to push him away. That's what guilt and shame will do. The third tactic, and this one's my favorite. This is the one I fall into all the time because I'm a big fan of it. The third one is reward. How many of you guys love rewarding your kids, right? It just sounds good, right? It seems like a good idea. And the main reason is is because when you shame a kid, they don't necessarily, like, want to come to you. They don't love you. When you use fear, they don't want to come to you and love you. But when you reward them, they keep coming back, right? Like, like oh, I'll do it again, Dad, because I really want whatever it is. And so it makes you feel really good. But the problem is you're creating a cycle, whether you know it or not, that now you're creating this, this concept where, let, let's give an example. Your kid has a hard time keeping the room clean. I know nobody deals with that, right? Your kids have a hard time keeping the room clean. So to get them to keep the room clean, you say, if you keep your room clean for 30 days, and I don't know what generation of kids you guys have, but my kid, like, would be begging for, like, okay, if I keep it clean for 30 days, I get Shopkins, right? The worst toy imaginable. It makes no sense to me. It's just tiny groceries. They're the worst, right? But they love them. Kids love them, right? Got the ultra rare one. No, that's a bag of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. It's the worst, right? So they have that, and they're just big fans of it. So what happens is she keeps her room clean really well for 30 days, and then I give her the reward. And now what do I have to do to get her to do it again for another 30 days? Oh, now I'm in a contract negotiation with my child. Like, okay, kiddo, that was awesome. Can we go another 30 days? I don't know. I mean, I already got the Shopkin. Now there's the collector's edition, Dad. And it's like, hey, I really do want to have that room clean. That'd be great, right? Hey, quit hitting your sister. Quit hitting your sister. If you stop hitting your sister, we'll get you this. I'm not dealing with the heart of the situation. I'm bribing them. And then that bribery has to continue and continue and continue. But what happens when the bribery has hit a level that you can't keep up with? You're literally, it's called this concept of moral economics. You're teaching your kid to put a value on right and wrong. So, if Shopkins isn't enough, my kid's just going to not keep their room clean. And we all know that shouldn't be the case. It's just a part of life. You keep things clean. It's, it's, a, it's a discipline we have in life. But now she doesn't care about the discipline of life. She cares about what are we going to get next. I'm literally instilling in her this concept of greed and stuff. If you look at it, Luke 12, it says right there, then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Because life's not measured by how much you own. But I'm teaching my child it is. Because the best thing you could do is if you do good, you get stuff. I've teach, I taught her that that's the heart of her father. You do good, I give you good. Now what is she going to do when she turns to the father? Well, God, I did good. Why are bad things happening? It's not a principle of Christianity. So I'm teaching her to go to God as only a provider rather than father through relationship and get her to understand, right? In our life, best example I could give, we went through, anybody go through potty training a child, it's one of the worst seasons of your life that you'll ever go through. It's like I didn't think it was so hard to convince a kid just to not pee here, go pee there. But for them, it's like, no, the problem is, is that's there and I'm here. Get it, dude, but it's super gross. Just go over there, right? So you wrestle with this, and it's frustrating. So we found that our daughter was a big fan of candy, and we never gave her candy. 
So it was like a special treat. You go to the bathroom, we'll give you, and I kid you not, man, I'm not trying to like justify it. We give her like a pinch of Starburst, right? A little pinch. We put it on her tongue. She's like, yeah. So she went from like going to the bathroom three times a day to going to the bathroom like 35 times a day. It was just nonstop. Like, dude, I got to go again. Here we go. It's like, Deek. like, come on, man. That's, but I got to follow through with my reward. And it was all great until she visited the dentist. I'm not kidding you, dude. This is a true story. She literally, like, rotted out her back four teeth. And the dentist is like, do you guys give her candy? We're like, no. We would never do that. And then Crystal's like, oh, you know what? We do every time she give her a little pinch of Starburst, and the dentist is like, you awful parents. We're like, rotted her teeth, dude. So what happens? Then we go back, and now I'm in a situation where I can't reward her with that anymore. Guess what? We had to start the process all over again. Is that a teacher? That's just what people do, man. People just don't pee their pants. They pee in the toilet. And I had to teach her all over again because she wasn't understanding that. She was understanding that, no, when you pee in the toilet, you get stuff. That's that kind of moral economics we teach our kids and we are constantly just giving it for reward rather than actually dealing with the heart and the principle of the situation to get them to understand what it is they're supposed to know. And I'm telling you, you're going to do this and it's an easy fallback. It makes sense. But it's not the principle of Christianity. Because where in there is the concept of sacrifice? Where in there is the concept of generosity? Where in, it doesn't line up with our Christian faith, this idea of like, oh, yeah, yeah, do good, get good. It, I mean, it's sowing and reaping. There's a little bit of that. But in the concept of the grand scheme of things, there are times that we sacrifice for the sake of the others. And I'm not teaching her that. I'm actually teaching her greed. Do more, get more. Do more, get more. Right? I'm instilling this principle into her mind. And so... I know, I just, like, ripped out everybody's, like, tactics of how we're raising kids, right? Believe me, I'm, like, right there with you, you know? I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Kevin um, today, or Pastor Kevin, as of today, he got, um, uh, there's a word for that, but it's out there. So we, he's a pastor as of now, amazing, uh, Dr. Pastor Kevin, um, excited about that, yeah, in our Christian Counseling Center. So I was talking to him about this principle, and it was that idea, we had a great conversation about this idea of temporary, and he says, here's the thing, like, everybody does it, right? Like, whether right or wrong, we all fall into it, but the main thing is that we have to learn to recognize when we fall back into those old tactics. And now I kind of want to talk to you about what, are, what is the way that we should be looking at how we're raising kids, okay? So those are temporary Band-Aid fixes. How do we actually shift our minds to where when our kids make a mistake, we don't see it as frustrating, angry, rage out, cover it with a Band-Aid, move forward. We instead look at it in a different way. And so the first way is in this concept of how do we lead our children, we have to look at and, and, and see how it is that God has kind of called us to lead our children. So I want us to look at Luke 15. Maybe you've seen this a different way. I'm going to change the focus a little bit. He says, if a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what's he going to do? Isn't he going to leave the 99 in the wilderness and go search for that one until he finds it? And he says when he's found it, he's going to joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he's going to call together all his friends, his neighbors. He's going to say, rejoice, I found that lost sheep. He says, in the same way, there's so much joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Your kids are sheep. If I could be honest with you, and if you got kids in here, you could cover their ears. Here's the thing. Kids are kind of dumb. Right? They're going to make dumb decisions their whole lives, dude. Teenagers, absolutely. Grown adults, absolutely. Kids make bad decisions all the time, right? But we need to look at it and say when they're making those bad decisions, how do we, instead of raging out on them, how do we carry that sheep on our shoulders and bring them back into the fold? Because that's our job is to bring those strayed, dumb sheep and do our best to bring them back into the fold and follow in line with what it is that God has for them. So the first thing we have to start looking at is that we got to start parenting with the process mentality, Okay you got a parent with a process mentality. That means that when they make their mistakes, and they will, it's when they make their mistakes, because they will, just like you. You're going to make your mistakes. So when they make those mistakes, it's not going to be a patch that you're going to be able to do that's going to fix them forever. They will likely, the odds are, they will make that mistake again. And so how do we lead them, rather than thinking it's a one-time deal, how do we lead them in this concept of it's an ongoing process. It's honestly the same way that you should be looking at your own life. As you've come to follow Christ, did you get it right away? Absolutely not, right? It was a process. And, and could you imagine that as you were going through that process, if you had somebody over your shoulder the whole time, and every time you came out of line, they were just like, hey, you screwed up again, you idiot. 
wouldn't you after a while be like, dude, I'm cool. Like, I, I'm not going to make it. There's too much pressure. They, if, if This is what happens every time I make a mistake. There's no way. And after a while, you're going to start pushing away from that individual, right? Same concept with us. We should be parenting with the process of this straight away. We should look at bringing correction, but in love and kindness, the same way God has done and the Holy Spirit has done in your life. Does that not mean there's consequences for your actions? Absolutely. But does it have to be done in rage and threats? Or can it just not be as simple as, kiddo, if you keep doing that, this is what's going to keep happening. It doesn't have to be rage and threats. It doesn't have to be with angst and anxiety and, and create this tension with you. It could just be as simple as an instruction of the sowing and reaping principles. All right? So again, Parenting with the process mentality, you got to parent as if it's one unending conversation. This is my biggest hiccup because I don't know if you guys realize this, I love to talk. I'm a big fan of talking. And so I always think every time my child makes a mistake that I'm going to talk them out of it, right? This one conversation is going to go about four hours and I'm going to give you a breakdown of all the reasons why this isn't a great decision to make in the future. We're going to walk it out, and at the end of it, we're going to come to an agreement that we're not going to make this mistake again, and my six-year-old is just trying not to eat her peas. Right? Like, that's sometimes what we do as parents. We overanalyze the situation. We feel like we have to have it all fixed now, but if instead you look at it as if your conversation is one unending, stackable conversation, that you're just leading them and guiding them through life, and you're going to be coming back to these conversations again and again, and trust me, for those of you guys who are grown, you know you're going to have this conversation when they're 5, when they're 15, when they're 25, when they're 35, when they're 45, that unending conversation is going to carry on through their whole life. That's what you signed up for as a parent. That's what you bought into is one unending conversation. So don't feel like you have to fix it right then. And don't get disappointed if you had a conversation and they make that mistake again. Because you have to look at it in the same way. It's a process. So maybe they did it once that week. And maybe after the conversation they did it, they waited two weeks. And then they made that mistake. And then the next time it's three weeks. But we have to look at not necessarily the right here and now. We're looking at it with the big picture in mind. Okay. The third way, the way that we have to parent is we got to parent with a project mentality, right? We got a parent as if it's like a project of building a house, right? We're building it from scratch. And so we're not going to right away start with the roof and cover it up. We're going to know. We got to lay a good foundation. And we got to add to it some walls. And we got to start building up this child. Again, they're not going to get everything all at once. We're going to build. And we're going to stack. And we're going to give them concepts. And we're going to go into it knowing that mistakes are going to be made. That we're going to have to potentially tear down a wall again and rebuild it anew. We're going to have to go into it that this is going to be an ongoing project throughout their lives that we're constantly going to be coming back to the table to have these conversations, to have these moments, to help them get in their alignment with the Father. Okay? That's like our job. We got to quit looking at the short-term fixes that make us feel good at that moment because they listen out, they behave really well, but the problem is they're only doing that because you have the covering. And once your covering is removed and they're 18 to 29, it appears that they keep walking away from the Father because nothing led them to Him. Okay? So, where do I lead them? Right? Where do I lead them? I want us to take a look at a couple concepts here of how we're leading our children. And the first one that I want us to come to terms with, okay? And, and this is something I actually had a great dialogue with an individual about because sometimes we feel like we have to be, to lead them to the Father, we need to be perfect parents that we have to be like a reflection of actually Jesus, and we have to come to terms with the fact that that is absolutely never going to be the case. We have to show them what it means to have a relationship with God, with Christ, and walk that out, but you're never expected to be perfect, right? I had this great conversation. If you guys missed out, we had our fire groups launch off this last Friday. It's like our men's small group that we do every third Friday of the month, get together around a campfire, and we just kind of all, I don't know if it's a campfire. We're not camping, but it's a fire that we're all sitting around. I don't know if there's a term for that. Whatever, dude. Don't analyze my words. But there's a fire, and we're all around, and we're just having a great conversation, you know. And so this individual, I, I asked him if I could share it. He said, absolutely. And he's sharing this idea that he lived a life a certain way, and his kids are now teenagers. And he wasn't following Christ. He was just living his life and doing his own thing. And his kids got to just kind of reap the fruit of that, right? They got to live a certain way for a long time. And he said he gave his life to Christ, and now he's changing a lot, and he's shifting a lot. And one, like some of the kids are having a hard time with it because they're used to the life that it used to be. And the other thing is he feels terrible because he feels like he's led his kids astray. Like, they've been raised in a different kind of environment, and he's realizing I should have been leading him differently. And it was so cool navigating this conversation with him because I had to let him know, dude, one of the most powerful things you could show your children is the power, transformation power of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the most powerful things you could show your kids is how you were one way and now you're a different way. Because here's the thing, no kid can argue about that. 
They could go to college and get an argument about science creation, which is all kind of malarkey. Been there, learned that. It's terrible. It makes no sense. But they do spit it as fact, and your kids can get caught up in these facts and these concepts, right? But what they can't argue with is, dude, I still don't know, because my dad, that dude was different. And after he found Christ, he became a whole new man, right? My dad, he used to be an alcoholic. He tried to quit a million times, but suddenly when he found Christ, something changed, and it shifted his life. They can't argue with that. That's one of the most beautiful things you can lead your kids through is your own transformation process. When we look at it in 1 Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should buy into this. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's great news. We all fit into that category. Your kids do too, right? Came to save sinners. And Paul says, dude, I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Then others are going to realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Some of your kids are going to look at you and be like, dude, my dad was crazy. Dude, my mom was nuts, right? You should have seen the way they acted. But then I saw what it was like for them to follow Christ. And it's literally this verse where your kids are like, so I know, I mean, I never went that crazy, and Christ still worked in their life. So, I mean, it seems like Christ would be willing to work in mine. Because he's willing to work in the worst of sinners, my dad. So he's got to be willing to work in me, right? Sometimes it's great for us to even lead in the example to say, like, kiddo, you have to understand, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to rage up a couple times. I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to fall. I'm going to make mistakes. But I want you to watch me and how I connect back with the Father afterwards. Right? We have to constantly be looking at this idea of where we are leading our kids to. Okay? Because here's the thing. Kids get distracted so easily. Don't they? Like, whatever trend it is, they devote their time. They're willing to just dive in completely to whatever it is that's the new trend. Right? Anybody remember when you were kids, some of the dumbest trends you jumped into? Right, like I can remember in high school, dude, this isn't that long ago, whatever, don't call me old. High school, right, 2003, let's go, right. So in high school, yo-yos came back. Yo-yos were like from the 20s, dude, not the 2020s. Like 1920s, yo-yos came out and they were the cool thing made of wood, you know, like, in, right. In high school, we're all sitting there with our yo-yos walking the dog and like it's the coolest thing and stuff. Because it was just trendy, so we all devoted ourselves to it because it's what everybody else was doing. Kids are, we are so dumb, we just get devoted to things because in the heart of every child is this desire to worship. It's this idea that we will devote everything. You can put that up there. It's this concept that children are just naturally going to dive in and they desire to worship something. And what that means is they're going to dive in to that tablet that you think is just an easy distraction. They're going to dive into that iPad. They're going to dive into Netflix. They're going to go full in. And, and you're going to say, it's not worship. Here's the thing. Whatever you devote yourself to is pretty much what you're worshiping. Whatever you're setting apart time for, whatever it is that you're prioritizing, that's your form of worship with your time. So if we come to the understanding that children have a desire to worship, then there is a way that we as parents can look and say, no, 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 kiddo. I know that that's cool. That's great. And, and in limitation, absolutely it is. But let me show you something that is beyond limitation. That if you devote yourself to this, you're never going to regret it, right? So where do we lead them to? That first thing we got to lead them into is this concept of to his glory. How do we do that? Pastor Brandon actually kind of did it earlier today with this idea of like, don't we just love the rain? Right? And you start with just the simple things in life with your kids, and you explain it to them, but you explain it to them, explaining it, how the glory of God is shown in that. And so if you ever just take a moment and you say, dude, here's the crazy thing about the rain. Like, God created the earth with, like, these concepts that we don't even think of. We didn't even put words to it until much later. But God literally created a water cycle so that we could survive. So we have the rain come down, and then it sits, and then it evaporates, and then over time it'll go back up. It goes back into the cloud, and then it comes back into the cloud, filtered out so we could drink it. Right? Like, it's a crazy concept that God had this in mind. It's a crazy concept how he built the ocean and the waves crash in. It's a crazy concept how we can look up and there are stars we have yet to find, but God created it just so we can marvel at it. God's glory is never ending, and you could find it everywhere. And if you keep connecting your child to it again and again, after a while when they're grown up and you're not there anymore, when it rains, they're going to be like, dude, I always remember my dad explained this to me once. When they look up at the stars when they're going home and they've just had a very difficult day, they're going to say, I remember when my mom told me about how God was willing to create all these things and how much he loves me. 
right? When you point it to his glory, then they start to see it everywhere as well, right? It says in Romans 1.20, ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth, the sky, and through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. But with our kids, we can give them an easy poke and prod to say, dude, that's God who made that. You see that bird? That bird was created for, that bird knew that when it jumped out of its nest, it's going to fly. At some point, it had to take that risk and go, right? Like, like that bird was built, it flaps his wing like 100 miles per hour. Like, there's so much that you can marvel at and show your kid and do it in just a loving, beautiful way, and they'll grab hold of it. And then they'll start sparking those conversations with you, right? Dad, isn't it crazy? Look at that ladybug. Right? And like start talking about creation itself, right? So we want to point him to his glory. The second thing is to wisdom. That's God's wisdom, right? Because here's the thing, we talked about it earlier. It's kind of the theme of the day. You know, kids, they're lacking wisdom. Right? Kids have a hard time with the concept of of thinking through consequences that are later on. They just want the right here and right now, right? So again, kids' wisdom tells me if that kid has a toy I want, and if I could take him. That's my toy, right? I, that's, that's my wisdom right now. I want it. I get it. It's mine. That's my wisdom, right? Now, we're trying to get them to understand God's wisdom. Can I tell you that it does not come naturally to kids to say, oh, I should do unto others as I'd want them to do to me. Okay, Jerry has that toy. I, I know I'd be mad if someone took the toy from me, so I'm not going to take Jerry's. No kid. No kid. Don't give me that. No kid has ever thought through the consequences and say, you know what, Jerry? I'm glad you have that toy. I'll wait here patiently and quietly. No kid has that naturally come to them, right? Now, you may have instilled some concepts and some wisdom to tell them, Jerry, would you like it if somebody took your toy? Then how do you think he feels? And we start instilling this at the very base level, little concepts of wisdom. And then as they get older, we start to tag it further and say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's not the best thing as a teenager for you to go up to the cabin with no parent supervision whatsoever. Maybe that's not the wisest decision you can make. But guess what? Kids are dumb, and they're like, oh, we're not going to do anything then why can't you have parent supervision? You're not going to do anything. Then what's the problem with having a parent there, right? It's like that whole idea. Like they just lack the wisdom, and it's our job to show them and say, well, maybe even how it's reflecting when others see it, they're going to assume you're doing something that you're not. And maybe it's going to hurt your even perceptions and your future opportunities to minister to, right? Wisdom. We got to give wisdom. And James, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. He gives it generously to all without reproach. It'll be given. So we, on the behalf of our, our kids, just got to constantly go to prayer and say, God, give them wisdom because they're the worst. No, I'm just kidding. They're not the worst. They're great. All right, the third thing we got to lead them to and lead them in, and this is the concept of the story of Christ. And if you don't yet know how to explain the gospel, the story of Christ, please do me a favor and spend some time. Take our foundation classes. Jump into a small group that's going to help you with this learning. Foundation level one will help you get an understanding of the story of Christ because it's so important as you're walking this out that you can not only Live it out, but you can articulate to your kids what it means to be somebody who follows Christ. What Christ was willing to do for you. I mean, it's the John 3, 16, 17, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And it says God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. If you can help your child understand that their mistakes are known, but also it's okay to come to the Father after you make them. And Actually, you should. That Jesus paid the price for your sins. Dude, there's nothing wrong that you're going to do that Jesus is not going to be willing to forgive. When you tell them that God doesn't just want you to love him, but God pursued you with his love and sent his son just so he could get to know you, right? Like, like these ideas, when you instill into him the story of Christ and how he came to earth just for us and laid down his life, like these are all things that your kid can hold on to all the way until they're grown when they make that major mistake because they will. And they'll say, you know what my mom and dad always told me, dude? No matter how bad it gets, Jesus is willing to forgive me of my sins. Right? That's the important component that in all things throughout, and trust me, you're not going to tell them once. The same concept as wisdom. You give them the golden rule. You're going to tell them once. It's not like after that they just got it. Again, it's one unending conversation that you're consistently pointing back to, like, hey, kiddo, I know you feel terrible. I know you feel bad. But understand, like, it's going to be okay. Christ loves you, man. That's never going to stop. You just keep coming back to him. It's the story of Christ. Keep pointing him to it, right? And then the fourth thing, the final thing, is we got to point them into relationship. And you can add to your notes here with the Father, right? 
into a relationship with the Father. Because here's the, the scary thing for some people, but it's just an understanding that we need to come to, and that is this idea. It says that, you know, absolutely your kids can know God because you've told them about him, and absolutely your kids can know Jesus because you told them about him. But it says even the demons do that, right? So it's this idea of, like, if you're not leading them into relationship, you're just giving them knowledge. There has to be something that takes them a step further. So where can they find that? Here's the number one way you could lead kids into relationship, and that's to have one. When you have a relationship with the father, they're naturally going to look to it and desire it. It's no different than how do you show kids how to have a healthy marriage. It's to have one. Right? So with your kids, if you're showing them a healthy reflection of what it is to come to the Father time and time again, what it means to praise him, what it means to worship him, what it means to devote your time to reading his word, what it means to sit on your knees and to pray and intercede, as your kids see that and they don't see it as like, oh, we got to go to church again, I know, we're missing football, right? Oh, we got to do this again. That's sending a message of like, dude, that sounds like the worst. When I'm older, I'm just not going to do it. So if you follow Christ begrudgingly, they're just going to not follow Christ at all. So that's how we reflect it. It's reflected in our relationship. It's reflected in how we lead them, okay? And it's going to tie into this concept in Matthew 28. And this idea of, of how we should be parenting our kids. And this is the number one theme throughout that I want you to grab hold of. You may not have ever applied this to kids, but I want you to know it's there. Jesus came and he told his disciples, he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, so therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new dis disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So what does that mean? Your number one job as a parent is to disciple your kids. This journey that we're on is a journey of discipleship for our children. And discipleship is twofold. One, it's absolutely the knowledge for them to know. But two, it's literally this idea of follow me and watch and see what I do and how I do. And so if your kids are only getting head knowledge but they're seeing something completely different, that's fake to them. And they're not going to buy into it. And neither did you. But when you see truth... When you see them walking it out, when you see that they desire a closer relationship, when you see that they have an absolute love and fire for the Father, something in you says, man, I, I feel like I want that. I feel like I need that. I feel like I'm missing out on something because it seems like they have something I don't. That's leading your kids through discipleship. Amen? That's what we're all striving to do because we all need to have the same end goal in mind. And that is that we're raising up adult followers of Christ. Amen? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.